getting, getting kind of hectic. You got the power today? All right. All right, for those of you that know that song, you know the build-up to that is it's getting, it's getting, it's getting kind of hectic. I don't know about you, but my life from time to time gets a little hectic, and I need the power today. That's what we're going to talk about today. But first, if you've got your Bibles or your phone, whatever it is that you take in the Word, let's hold that up and let's confess this today. This is my Bible. It is the Word of God. It is life to me. Today I receive the Word. I confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I am obedient. I will never be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I look to you today for grace and strength. Speak through me, I ask. Lord God, just guard my words that they would be your words today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope you're loving this series, I've Got the Power. I'm honored today to be here to to stand and give the word today. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Pastor Tim, and I'm the Freedom and Care Pastor. Pastors Terry and Anita are away. They're ministering in Alma, Georgia today. Pastor Terry has got a word for that church today. It's a young man who he's known for years and years um, from the denomination where, where he was before, and he's up there blessing them today. So today, I get to talk to you about transformer power. So one of the coolest um, little movie series that I like, I don't know about you, I hope you do too, is Transformers. Any Transformer fans? Love Transformers, okay? Okay. So for those of you that do, don't know, but you probably do, you know, this series began as a cartoon in the 80s, which, you know, what, there he is, Optimus Prime, come on, cartoon Optimus Prime in the 80s. You know, in the 80s is probably the greatest decade ever. It's got the greatest music, greatest cars, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just the greatest. But anyway, eh, some of you agree, some of you don't, right? Maybe not the greatest cars. Let's drop back to the 70s or the 60s for some cars, all right? Now you're with me, but the greatest music, all right? Come on. Yeah, there we go. I got you back now. So let me tell you a little bit about Transformers. The premise is the Autobots, good guys, all right? We got to have good guys. It's a race of robots disguised as ordinary vehicles that when called upon to protect someone in trouble, they would transform into huge protective fighting robots. Their main nemesis are the Decepticons, bad guys, who are trying to destroy the human race. Six movies later, with a seventh in the mix now, and the battle between good and evil still rages. You and I know that because the battle between good and evil rages every day in the world that we are in. The battle between good and evil rages every day in our lives as we move forward to do good and to follow what God has placed us on, the path that he has placed us on. Today we're going to look back at our lives and the battles that we all face. And while I can't turn you from a Thank you very much, Edwin, from a Peterbilt truck, not a Mack truck like I said in the first service, or a Camaro into a battle-hardened fighting robot machine. I do have good news for you today. The Holy Spirit wants to transform us from defeated Christians to Christians who are walking in freedom and victory. And if that's you today, that's a good place to give the Lord some praise today. As you and I pass from adolescence into adulthood, and especially if we have accepted Jesus as our Savior, we pretty much know the difference between right and wrong, right? I mean, nobody pretty much has to tell us what's right and what's wrong. I mean, come on, if we have no problem telling our children and our friends how they should live, why can't we get past our own bad habits and behaviors? It seems that no matter how hard we try, we continue to do what Paul said in Romans 7. 15 through 24. I'm going to read this from the message this morning. Paul writes, what I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. But I need something more, for if I know the law, and I'm going to use the definition of the law here as reform or forced behavioral change. Just hang on to that. But I still can't keep it. And if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, and then I do it anyway. 
My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. Paul says it happens so regularly that it's predictable. I can relate to that. You plan and plan, and you say, I'm not doing that anymore, and then you turn around, and it's right there in front of you again. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take the charge. I've tried everything. Nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? Think about that. The Apostle Paul wrote that for us. We're going to answer that question. We're going to come back to that, so I want you to hold on to that. But, you know, it sounds to me like Paul, you know, Paul wrote four of the books of the Bible while he was in literal prison. It sounds to me like he's talking about living in a spiritual prison in which he is trying to break out of. See, prisons keep you and I from our freedom. That's your first fill-in today. And I hope that you're going to go ahead and take notes because some of the fill-ins that we, that we write out in the beginning today, we're going to come back to at our time of prayer in the end. So prisons keep us from our freedom. They also keep us from our future. Many of the prisons we find ourselves in today are built by one of three things. These three things are this. A sin we can't leave, a hurt that we receive, or a lie that we believe. Let me say that again. These are the prisons that hold us back. A sin we can't leave, a hurt that you and I receive, something's done to, something is done to us, or it's a lie that we believe. See, when we try to let go of our sins and our hurts and our lies, but then we fail to, they build up and build up and to the point where we just accept and embrace it. And at our core, we allow it to control and define us, and that sets us on a disastrous course. <coughs> Excuse me. See, we see this even way back in the beginning of the Bible as a part of human nature, beginning back in the garden in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve believed the lie of the enemy about eating from the tree that God told them not to. Remember the lie that the serpent told Eve, you will not surely die. Do you see how Satan took this and twisted and made this lie, just a little bit of truth and twisted it? Because what he said was, you won't drop dead. That's what he inferred to Eve. You can eat it, you're not going to drop dead. And he was right. They didn't drop dead, but sin entered the world that day. Spiritual death and separation from God came that day. So he took this and he just twisted it just enough to get Eve to believe. See, the lies that we believe separate us from the destiny that God has for us. Because they believe the lie, Adam and Eve couldn't leave the sin of eating the fruit. They couldn't go back and change it. They had already done it the hurt that they receive, and all three of these put them into a spiritual prison. The hurt that they received was guilt and shame to the point that they tried to hide from God. Remember, they hid, then they made, them, they made clothes for themselves. And when they couldn't hide from God, when God called them out, they attempted to deceive God by blaming others for their failures and their sin. Sound familiar? Sometimes we do that, right? We won't, don't want to take the responsibility, so we tend to blame others. Eve said this, the serpent, God, you created this being. It was supposed to be here for us. The serpent deceived me, and I gave in. Adam, the woman you gave me. You know, I've read this verse probably 50 or more times, all right? It never hit home to me until I was studying for this. I never really saw this before. Adam tried to blame God for the sin that he had willfully committed. It was like he looked at God. Remember, they were buddies, right? The, God, the Bible says they walked with each other in the cool of the day. So it would be like, like me saying, but dude, God, it was the woman you gave me. If you hadn't given me the woman, I wouldn't have sinned. He didn't want to take the responsibility for himself. You know, sometimes when we're preparing teachings, God speaking to us. And he really spoke to me. This one hit me super, super hard. Because God reminded me how I tend to do that. I tend to do that with my wife sometimes. More often than I'd like. 
not necessarily for sin, but if I make a mistake doing something and she's there with me, I'll try to say, well, honey, if you hadn't have done this or said this, because I don't want to take the responsibility for myself. And baby, I'm sorry. I want to publicly say that to you today because I know that's wrong and I know that hurts you. And I don't want to continue to do that. So God really spoke to me. And I share that with you because I want you to know that as I stand before you taking this, teaching this sermon today, I'm on the same journey you're on. We are in this together. We're walking shoulder to shoulder to find the victory that God wants for all of us. See, the list goes on. Someone hurts us, and we feel offended. Then we carry unforgiveness. And even though we want Christ and others to forgive us, sometimes that hurt causes fear to creep in, and the fear becomes overwhelming. It cripples us from pursuing our purpose and our destinies. Unforgiveness, unfortunately, can also turn to anger. It's a byproduct of unforgiveness. And we look up, and we've just become an angry person, mad at everybody and everything get to the point where everything gets on our nerves everything that's said to us any little thing that just doesn't go right i knock this over oh that gets on my nerves i I get a knot in my shoestring that gets on my nerves somebody says something that gets on my nerves and i look up and if i allow that to settle into me i look up and i'm going to end up as one of those crotchety old men telling kids stay off my lawn i don't want to do that i don't want to be that way i want to walk in victory and freedom i want to walk in the joy of the Lord and that's what I want you to walk in today also is the joy of the Lord so I want to give you today I want to give you a quote by one of the most famous and one of my favorite theologians ever and that is Bob the tomato Bob the tomato says this if you hold on to your anger it will hold on to you if you don't know who Bob the tomato is, Google it when you get home. And parents, yes, you should still be showing your kids veggie tales. It has some of the greatest truths out there we can ever take in. In your notes, we've re- rewritten this to make it personal. And this is where I want you guys to fill in. I want you to take a moment and fill this in. We're going to come back to this at the end of the service. If I hold on to my anger, or you can pick the emotion or the hurt, it will hold on to me. If I hold on to my anger or a different emotion or a different hurt, it holds on to me. Let me also go to the next one here. Maybe this one's a little bit better one for you to fill in. I allow the spirit of fear to tell me I can't. What is it that the spirit of fear is trying to keep you from accomplishing? What is it that you know in your heart of hearts God has set you and he has made you and created you for, but you're just not sure if you can do it? That spirit of fear is settled over you, or a spirit of depression, or a spirit of anxiety. Whatever that spirit is, fill that in today. At the end, we're going to get some tools to fight this, so I want you to stay with me on this. So we take that anger, unforgiveness, fear, and then we add in pressures like marriage, jobs, school, family, relationships, kids, illness, COVID, political unrest, racial unrest. Where does it end? I don't know what to do. I can't handle it anymore. We get to the point where we say, you know what? I might as well just give in. I might as well just give up. We begin to take for granted that nothing's ever going to change. We verbalize, I can't do this. I'm not strong enough. We turn to other things to cope and ease the pain. Maybe we turn to vices, alcohol, drugs, pornography. Maybe we turn to something that's positive in and what itself, but it's something that we sink ourselves into so deeply that it takes us away from relationships, relationship with God, and fulfilling our purpose. It could be a great hobby. It could be golf. It could be fishing. It could be playing video games. It could be watching football. It could be anything that we say, I'm just going to numb my mind to everything else that's going on, and I'm just going to do this. And God's sitting there saying, but what about me? I want to be in your life. The pressures build, and they not over only overwhelm us spiritually, but they can overwhelm us mentally and physically also. Let's listen to what David wrote in Psalm 38, 4 through 8. He says, My guilt or the pressures overwhelm me. It's a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and stink because of my foolish sins. I'm bent over and I'm racked with pain. All day long I walk around filled with grief. 
a raging fever burns within me and my health is broken. I'm exhausted and completely crushed. My groans come from an anguished heart. There's probably a piece of here that all of us can identify with from time to time. Guilt and pressure may overwhelm us. It feels like a burden that's too hard to bear. We think, oh my word, I, I, here's what I've done and my foolish sins. I'm bent over and racked with pain. Raging fever burns within me. I'm exhausted. God, I can't go on. I can't do this anymore. I'm completely crushed. My groans come from a hurt and broken heart. Have you ever felt like that? Come on, tell me I'm not the only one that's felt like that. <laughs> Take heart. We are in fantastic company this morning. I'm going to talk to you about four people that you know well from the Word of God. First one is Moses. Moses, I'm going to give you the five reasons that he gave to God on why he would not or could not fulfill his purpose. I'm not adequate for the task. Who am I? How about that? Have you ever said that to God? I can't do this. There's no way. Who am I? I don't know enough. I'm not smart enough, God. People would never take me seriously. They know what I've done. They know things about me. They would never take me seriously. I'm no good with words. I'll stumble over what I say. Then he just came down to, I'm not willing. Bro, I don't want to do this. You ever said that to God? I just flat don't want to do this. God's telling you to go and fulfill this. Sometimes we just have to work with that and say, God, I'll go ahead and do it. We make all these excuses, but see, here's the thing. In the end, God told Moses, I promise you I'll be with you. God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Jesus said he's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. He said, when I go away, I'll send another, the comforter, who will be with you. How about this guy, Elijah, one of my favorite Old Testament um, Bible characters. After a great victory, remember, he had the, um, he's there with all the prophets of Baal and Asherah, and they, uh, they're, they're, they're saying, I've got a contest on whose God is going to answer. And the prophets of Baal and Asher are cutting themselves. They're doing everything they do. Their God doesn't answer. Finally, Elijah says, okay, enough. I want you to get all these barrels of water. And they poured it over the sacrifice and flooded the altar and ran down. I love Elijah's prayer because it was short, simple, and to the point. Now, I am just enamored with and have great, the utmost respect for intercessory prayer warriors, prayer warriors that can get on their knees I remember my mom and dad would see them on their knees for just, I don't know, for me as a kid, it seemed like hours at a time. And if that is you, I honor you today. But sometimes we got to know how to touch heaven in the spur of the moment. Elijah said this, that your people will know that you are God and you are turning their hearts back to you. And instantly fire fell and consumed not only the sacrifice, but the whole altar. Elijah gets just so empowered by the Spirit of God that he kills 500 prophets of Baal and Asherah that day. The great man, one of the greatest victories that we see in the Old Testament. He gets there, and the next day, after doing this, the queen says this, shouldn't have done that, bro. I'm going to get you. And that great victory turns into despair to the point where Elijah runs and tells God, I've had enough. I want to die. I can't do this anymore. And he laid down and he slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him. But God, in your darkest moment, remember, but God, he is always there. The angel touched him and, and he saw and said, get up and eat. Elijah looked around and beside his head was some baked bread on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and laid down and was refreshed again. Let's move to the New Testament. Peter. Peter goes from denying Christ. The Bible says, And Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. You and I probably don't deny Christ with our words. But how about with our thoughts and with our actions? How many times have we trampled on that grace? But this same Peter, when empowered with the baptism in and with the Holy Spirit, believers, I have to encourage you today, you have got to be, ask God to instill this gift, give you this gift of being baptized in and with the Holy Spirit. Peter denies Jesus to the point where he's cursing at people, talking about, I don't know him. 
the next time we see Peter. He is preaching one of the greatest sermons the world has ever heard, where 3,000 were added to the church. Peter stands up, and he speaks out with bold urgency. I want to give you a list of some of the things that Paul went through. He says, I was in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, face death often. From the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day and night in the deep. In perils among false brethren. In weariness and toll. In sleepness often. In hungry and thirsty. Cold and naked. And then he ends up with this. And on top of all that, you give me this daily deep concern for all the churches. Now, I tell you, if there's a recipe to give up and say, I don't want to do this anymore, I think that's it. Man, shipwrecked three times in the ocean over a day and a night, and then all this concern. Well, as these specific things may not happen to us, but we all have trials and tribulations. We all have things that are coming against us on a daily basis. It might be illness. It might be pressures from a job. It might be relationships. It's all these things. And then we say, we have concern for our brothers and our sisters or concern for our families. God, I don't know what to do. But see, through it all, Paul had the power of the Spirit resting on him because he wrote this after he was baptized in and with the Holy Spirit. He drew on that power. These four men and others in the Word had something in common. To succeed, they all needed and accepted and received the transformative power of the Holy Spirit in their lives to gain freedom and victory. See, in the Old Testament, the Spirit came upon our Old Testament prophets in their specific time of need to give them situational strength, power, and provision for victory in the battle. But, but in the New Testament and moving forward to you and I, like the apostles, believers today, we have the ability to continually draw on the power of the Spirit if we have been baptized in and with the Holy Spirit because He dwells in us. He rests on us, continually giving us that power. You know, studying this, I, always, I, I love when, when God teaches me things because I continually need to learn new things. So as I was studying, I learned something that is vital to us as Christians if we're going to live a victorious life. For years, I've been using the term transformational power of the Holy Spirit. As I was studying, God led me to this term, and it's the transformative power of the Holy Spirit. While the words are very similar, the meanings could help unlock real change in our lives. Let's look at transformational power as it relates to leadership. Transformational leadership is reform-minded. The definition is this, favoring or pro promoting reform often by government action. When I think of reform-minded, I think of forced change behavior. Don't touch that. Don't touch that. Don't touch that. Pick the child up. I said, do not touch that. That's power. You're forcing that change, right? I think about that. Remember, Paul tells us, I already know the law. I know that reform forced behavioral change, but I still can't. I, I can't make it work in my life. Just because the rule is this doesn't mean that, that we will keep that. Paul wrote that when he wrote this, again, remember, he had already been baptized in and with the Holy Spirit. He's showing us that along with the law, Holy Spirit will not force change in us. So how does the Holy Spirit help us? Through transformative power. This is a power that seeks to disrupt that which is taken for granted. The definition is this, causing or able to cause an important and lasting change in something. I don't know about you, but that's what I want. I want the Holy Spirit to cause a lasting change in me. I don't want to just walk this line because it's the law and the rule. I want the change to come from inside of me so that I'm doing this because I want to. I'm doing this because it shows and gives glory to God. See, we as Christians, let me back up just a second. When I think about this lasting change, I think to getting the root, getting to the root of what and why needs to be changed. I want the desire to change instead of just trying not to do something. It's kind of like getting saved because I want a relationship with Jesus versus I just don't want to go to hell. I used to put it this way years ago as a youth pastor. I had all these kids that weren't just not going to hell. They weren't really walking with God. They just 
didn't want to go to hell. So every Sunday and every Wednesday, they'd get saved again because of all the things, because they were so afraid of just going to hell. Well, we know that a relationship or being saved is more than that. It's a relationship with Jesus. And that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. When we are baptized in and with the Holy Spirit, we have relationship with the Holy Spirit. He comes in and dwells with us and gives us that power. See, we as Christians need to stop settling for defeat. We need to stop taking for granted that sin, depression, anxiety, fear, shame, and guilt will always control us. So what's the answer? How do we gain freedom and victory? Let's go back to Romans 7. I want to read this again. Paul writes, I've tried everything. Nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? I love it how Paul answers his own question as we move forward into Romans 8. He writes this. So there is therefore now no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Let's get rid of guilt. Let's get rid of shame. There's no condemnation. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature... Think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your minds leads us to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life. And he also writes, you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Let's get rid of fear. No more fear. Instead, you have received God's Spirit. When he adopted you as his own, now we call him Abba Father which literally means daddy. Let me put this in perspective on what your heavenly father wants. Parents, you'll be able to relate to this. It's one of my greatest memories of my daughter being little. It's when she would walk up to me and, and, and she would literally say, hold you me, daddy, hold you me, daddy, hold you me, daddy. I just scoop down and hold her up. Well, that's what your heavenly father is sitting on the throne today. And he's waiting for you to come to him and just say, hold you me, father, hold you me, daddy, and just get into his lap. He wants to provide you. He wants to love you. He wants to break all of those things off of you. He wants to give you the comfort that you need. He doesn't want to leave you out there on your own, all alone. It says the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, when we don't know what to pray, God wants to pray for us. The Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father, who knows all hearts, knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. That's why it's so important to be baptized in and with the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. I don't know about you, but that's what I want my daily prayers to be. I want them to be in harmony with God's will. When we allow Holy Spirit to lead us and work his power in us, he shows us the root of the whys, why I do things. And he gives us the power to overcome. But we have to seek that change and allow him to work in us. So you say to me, okay, Tim, you know, that sounds really good. Some pretty good thoughts there. But how do we do this practically? I'm glad you asked. Wherever you are on your journey today, whether you're thinking about beginning a relationship with Jesus or you're currently serving Jesus, or you're serving him and you're baptized in and with the Holy Spirit, we, ha- we all need next steps, right? We all need to continue to move forward and daily practice in walking in the Holy Spirit's transformative power to live in freedom and victory. Don't you want to walk in freedom and victory? I know I really, really do. And not only that, We want to be like our friend Bumblebee, who has the transformative power to change, but then reach out and help protect and lead others into freedom and victory. See, we have a responsibility to our brothers and sisters. We have a responsibility as we're being led in freedom and as we're gaining victory, we need to turn around and help someone else up, turn around and help somebody else lead them to freedom and victory because we get stronger and we can help others in their journey just like B in this clip. Watch this with me. I love 
love that at the end. He transforms us in the middle of the battle. He sees his friend, his buddy, right? The guy who's been driving him when he's a car. He sees him and he's in trouble. And he transforms into that power-fighting robot. And then he gets down and extends his hand like, I got your back, buddy. I got you. It's going to be okay. I got you six and all of this. And that's what I want from, from us. We need to reach out to one another. That's why it's so important that, that we get into a freedom life group. That's our first next step today. I want you to join a freedom life group. Show of hands. Who's already signed up for life groups already? Awesome. Looking good. Looking good. By the end of the day, I'd like this to be 100%. Let me tell you a little bit about freedom life groups. Freedom Life Groups are an eight-week study and a one-day experience that we will go through to, together as a church. Every life group in the fall semester is going to be a Freedom Life Group. And it's designed to help you find freedom in your life. We're going to learn together about God's love, His grace, His forgiveness, and mercy. Things that are going to help us overcome guilt, shame, worry, fear, anxiety, and anger. We're going to learn about our identity and authority in Christ and the power that it has to set us free and deliver us from things that hold us back from what's God's best for us. I want you to watch this testimony about a Freedom Life group from my buddy Jimmy Strasser. Here at the Father's House, we believe in everybody in the congregation getting into a life group. Uh, this fall, we have a great opportunity for you to join what we are calling a Freedom Group and a Freedom uh, Study. It is a great opportunity for yourself to kind of understand who you are and what you're about and bring you closer to Jesus Christ, our Savior. Uh, when I went through last fall, it brought out things inside of me that I thought I already put away and surrendered to Him, which I was exposed that I had not and I was still holding on to Him. I don't know if it was because I was ashamed of Him or whatnot, but it gave me tools uh, that I believe were necessary for everyone to just free your soul up and give everything to Jesus, surrender your complete entire heart to Him. Um, and doing it in a life group allows other people within the congregation to kind of help you along the way. Uh, you're not just doing it on your own, you have a support structure that they can give you some tools and just keep you accountable and keep you moving towards uh, that goal of surrendering your complete self to Jesus Christ. So this uh, fall semester, get out there, sign up, get yourself in a freedom group. Thanks, Jimmy. Appreciate that. And this year, I want to give honor to Tanya, our Next Steps director. She has designed a freedom semester where nobody's going to be without any excuse. We have groups that every single person, no matter what your situation, can get into. We're going to have our traditional home groups where you'll go to somebody's home and meet. We have groups that are going to meet in a community setting, maybe in a restaurant or a park or a library, something like that. We're going to have Zoom groups for some of you that say, you know, I just really want to do a life group online. So we're going to have online Zoom groups. And new this semester, I am so, so excited about this. People have often said to us, we can't get into life groups, Tim, because either we don't drive at night or we just can't drive far or get out. So on Tuesdays, we are going to run and operate three different life groups here at the Father's House. We're going to do one at 10 o'clock, one at 2, and one at 6.30. So it will give everybody an opportunity to join a particular life group. Now, freedom groups begin on October 10th, but sign-ups are going on right now. If you're online, you can text groups to 352-329-2301, or you can get on the Father's House website and um, at some forward slash groups to sign up, or you can go out in the foyer and sign up. That's the best way. You're already here today. Just go out in the foyer and flood that table today, all right? Just overwhelm that table today, and let's sign up for life groups. Now, there's a great workbook that goes with it, and you get to purchase this. It's $10, and I'm telling you, this isn't just something that you're going to use during Freedom Life Groups and throw it on the shelf. Um, when Edwin was saying, um, you know, Tim, hey, let me get your Freedom Book, I'm like, hey, can you get me a new one? Because mine is coming apart, because I'm always going back to it. I'm always rereading and, and going through the questions and the answers. So this is not only a book for Freedom Life Groups, it's a book that will carry you forward. We're selling those out there, so let's get our books today, too. One of the things you could do, if you wanted to, is you could become a Freedom Life Group table host. If you say, hey, I'd like to help out in one of the groups on Tuesday night, on your connection card, you could just write on their um, table host. I know we've already filled them out. Grab another card, write on their table host. Tanya will get a hold of you. 
Let me get back to the book real quick. One thing I, I, I want to let you know, husbands and wives, get your own book, okay? Because this is so individual that you don't want to share a book because there's, there's places where you're going to be wanting to write things in and your husband or wife will also be wanting to write something in. So you say, Tim, man, I got a lot going on. I can't really wait until October 10th. What have you got for me to help me on this journey? I want you to go to our website, thefathershouse.com, and click on the newly created Freedom and Care tab. I want to give honor to Pastor Anita and to Tanya and to Maggie, who, who, who just, man, they, they take care of all this, and they fix this up, and they gave me this great Freedom and Care tab where you can contact me directly. There's links to pastoral care. There's links to our family care, and there's links to celebrate recovery. You can even do this even a little bit easier. You can call TFH at 352-315-1815. Ask for Pastor Tim, and I'd love to sit down and have a chat and pray with you just to see what God would say to you. So Jesus says that he came to give us life and life to the full and abundant life, and that's in John 10.10. 10. At TFH, that's what we want for you. We want to lead you into a growing relationship with Jesus, a relationship that gives you a full life, that gives you great relationships to help hold you accountable and help encourage you, life-changing faith and a life-altering freedom. Again, believers, I want to encourage you to pray that God baptizes you in and with the Holy Spirit, gives you this free gift of the Holy Spirit. We're going to pray in a few minutes, but I'd like for you to look back over those fill-ins. What is it that you're holding on to? What is that emotion that you're holding on to? Is it anger? Is it fear? Is it depression? Is it anxiety? Is it sadness? Or what is the spirit of fear or the spirit of anxiety, the, the spirit of depression? Whatever it is that you've filled in, keeping you from. Today, we are going to prepare ourselves to walk in freedom and victory. We're going to take the first step before our freedom groups. And we're going to do this by climbing inside the ark. The ark has always been a symbol of safety. Noah's ark was this symbol of safety. We're going to climb inside the ark today. And the ark stands for three things. It stands for admit, renounce, and confess. So you might say, well, Tim, if I admit and renounce, then I've kind of confessed. I want to give you just a little bit different definition of what I mean when I say confess. In the, in the original Greek, confess also means to acknowledge, to say the same things as another, or to agree with. So what we're going to do during our prayer time is I pray out loud, you guys are going to take your papers and you're going to pray over this. You're going to admit to God that this is something you're struggling with. You're going to renounce it, that you don't want to struggle with this anymore through the power of God. Not by our might, not by our spirit, but by the spirit of God. And then we are going to confess who we are in Christ. We are going to come into agreement with what God already says about us. And I got a little homework for you to take this through your week. You can all go to Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2, and even into 3 and 4, but specifically um, chapters 1 and 2, where Paul writes... And you're going to take all the you are statements and you're going to turn them into I am statements. Paul writes things like you are adopted, you are chosen, you are loved, you are accepted. And we're going to turn those into I statements. I'm adopted, I'm loved, I'm accepted. And that's our homework for the week. But today, silently, as I pray here in a moment, you're going to admit, renounce, and confess. And together, we're going to climb into this ark of safety. So let's bow our heads. I want you to put that thing in your mind and begin to do this. Heavenly Father, I thank you, thank you, thank you that you sp sent the Spirit. God, I ask for any believer who is not baptized in and with the Holy Spirit that you would baptize them in your Spirit. You would send your Spirit into their lives. They would experience this life-changing power, this life-altering power that you want us all to have. Today, God, we admit these things that are holding us back. We admit the fears, anger, depression, anxiety, sadness, all these different things that hold us back from completing what you would have. We're holding on to them, and we admit that today. We renounce this, not by my might, not by my power, by the Spirit of the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit of the Lord today. We give that over to you. 
and then we boldly confess that we are children of the living God. We are saved. We are sanctified. We ask to be filled with the Spirit. We say we want to walk in victory. We know we are chosen. We know our identity is in Christ. You did not give us a spirit of fear. You want us to walk in this freedom and victory that you have for us. So we come into agreement with all of the things that we know we are as a child of God today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. I want you to walk in that victory today. It's our first step. Our second step is joining a life group so that we can continue on that journey. But see, some of you may be out here today and you're saying, wow, Tim, being filled with the Holy Spirit, walking in victory, all these things sound really great, but I'm not even sure that I have a beginning relationship with Jesus. Or maybe I had a relationship with Jesus, but I've wandered away over the year. I just kind of like to redo that pull that back together. I'd like to submit my life to God today. I'd like to try that again. I want to give my life over to Christ. If we could just bow our heads again, please. And if I'm talking to you today, if you know without a shadow of a doubt that I'm talking to you, you feel this little tug in your heart, maybe your palms are getting sweaty, you're feeling God calling you, would you just raise your hand? I want to pray with you today. Thank you, sir sir. I don't want to embarrass anybody. I just want to pray with you. Thank you. Thank you over here on the side. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you in the back. Hands all over here today. We are going to pray a prayer together. Thank you in the back over here to my left. Thank you. We are going to pray a prayer together because you know what? We're a family and nobody should ever pray this prayer alone. So let's all pray this prayer together. And if that's you online, I want you to pray this prayer also. Dear God, thank you for sending your son to pay the penalty for my sins. I want to submit my life to you. I want to come home to you. I accept your forgiveness. Fill me with your spirit. As best as I can, I want to walk with you every day. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Church, how about we celebrate today, hey? And online, we're celebrating with you today also.